All right. So charge is quantized. And we have the symbols for uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons. A neutron is N, a proton is P. Protons have an opposite charge of electrons is 1.602 times 10 to 19 plus positive, right? Um, and those two cancel each other out. If you have one proton and it has an electron, if you're far away from it, then it appears the charge is zero. Neutrons, we saw their quarks, the total fractional charge equals zero. And so they don't have any, they don't have any charge. Even though it's composed of things that do have charge, but let me turn this thing on. This, I love this thing. Um, this is a Van de Graaff generator. So in here, there is a, a rubber belt down in here. And uh, at the bottom, there's an electric motor. So when I turn it on, the belt will start to spin around. And down in the bottom, there's a, some uh, copper wire that brushes against here. And as the rubber belt passes the copper wire, um, it takes some of the electrons from the copper. And then there's another piece of copper wire up here, a little strand that's connected to this top part. And so what it does is it carries electrons up here and deposits them on this thing. And so this becomes very charged. Uh, it, can, it has a lot of, uh, it really has uh, a lot of charge on it. And so, uh, if you leave it on, it gets a little bit scary, but I have a grounding thing here. So what I'm going to do is on my little, I have this, this other ball here. And so I'm going to hook this to something that's grounded. All right, what is grounded? Ah, here we go. I'm going to connect this to here. And then I'll try and connect this guy to here. What do we have to do? Oh, I found a wire. Okay. So I'm going to connect this wire. I'm going to jam it in there, so, and I'm going to make this connected to ground because what I want is I want to have something that's grounded so that I can discharge this without shocking myself. It always, always shocks me. So I'm making a connection. Screw this in here so it and I'm gonna turn this on for a minute. And I'm gonna put some fur up here and we'll see what happens to this guy. Cat fur. Maybe maybe it's chinchilla, I don't know. Okay, so I'm just gonna load it up there. Okay, I'm gonna grab this thing. Uh, hold this in front of me.
That did, that was really disappointing. <laughs> Let's try again. Oh, there we go. Okay, turn it off. Okay. So here we go. So we'll hold this here and see what happens. So, so every time it apparently the projector All right. Oh, turn this off. Oh, I guess there's a little interference in there. See, that's why I always tell you that uh, there's that little warning. It says, caution, this device must accept uh, interference. So, um, but when charge is being carried here, the charge builds up on, um, on the top of here. We start building up a bunch of electrons, and then um, once it's built up here, I can discharge it to something else. Okay, so if I take my ground off here, let me get my camera. Okay. There we go. We'll get this a little closer. Okay. You see it? All right. So I'm going to get this charged up a little bit. And then I'm going to connect this and. Oh, that was pretty. We're gonna Ooh. okay. So now I have this thing charged up. So I've got charge on here, and I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it over here on my detector, maybe. So I'm gonna. It'll be a little quicker. Oh, that doesn't work. Forget that, but all right. But I can store charge on here. Oh, and if you feel it, um, if you feel an electric field, it feels like your arm hair is sticking towards it. So when you create something with a lot of charge, electric field lines start coming off of this. And 
they will pull your hair towards the surface of this. So you'll start to see your hair stand up. That's why uh, before you get struck by lightning, um, all of your hair will start to stand up on your head. Okay. So if you're ever walking in a flat field and there's a thunderstorm and you feel your hair start to stick up, you should take cover immediately because that means you are about to get struck by lightning because all the electric field lines will come down from the clouds and they will be focused on your head. Usually it's the tallest, pointiest thing in the field. And if it's only you, then um, you will probably get struck. So um, same thing in a pool. Uh, of course, your hair will be wet, so you won't feel it stick up. All right. So let's go on. All right, so here's the question. Um, when a physical quantity such as charge can have only discrete values rather than any value, we say it's quantized. Now, if I start with a sphere and my sphere A has a charge of minus 50 E, so I have one sphere with minus 50 E and another charge has a sphere of plus B, or the sphere B has a charge of plus 20 E, um, and I combine those, I touch them together. Um, what's the resulting charge on sphere A going to be? Yes. Negative what? So it's not negative 15. Um, so I start with minus 50 on one, and then I have plus 20 E on another one, right? So when I combine them, that means that um, 20 of the negative 50 will go to counter out that, that positive 20 E. So I'd say minus 50 plus 20, that's gonna give me negative 30. So wait. No, you're right, because they would split up on both spheres, right? So, wait, what? So, you're right, it was minus 15. So yes, you are absolutely right because you would, you'd have minus 30 and then the charges redistribute themselves. And so you're right, it is minus 15. So you'd have minus 15 on each sphere. Half of the charge would go to one sphere and half of the charge would go to the other chair. And lots of my colleagues are afraid to put videos online because they're like, what if I make a mistake? Uh, I'm not afraid of that. I make mistakes all the time because I know that most professors don't watch YouTube. So there's very little danger of them seeing me doing something stupid. Um, all right, so yes, that's absolutely right. All right. The other important result is we have charges quantized, but it's also conserved. That means we can't really destroy an electron or a proton under normal circumstances. It is possible to destroy a, an electron if we have an anti-electron, but that would be the only way that we could lose an electron. So an anti-electron is called a positron, and it's just like an electron, except it has a positive charge and we call it antimatter, okay? So there's uh, anti-electrons, which are positrons, and there's also anti-protons as well too. You can get those too. Uh, uh, and so what uh, we observe is sometimes a gamma ray will change forms 
and it will produce a, an electron and a positron. So those two things will, uh, those two particles will be created. Uh, this happens when uh, a gamma ray passes close to the nucleus of an atom. Sometimes you'll get suddenly these two different charged particles. And so we have a transformation of the gamma ray into matter. Now, that's okay because gamma rays have a lot of energy. And we can change energy into matter. That's not a problem. Okay? Um, but if we do change energy into matter, we still have to have conservation of charge. And so when the gamma ray uh, gets annihilated and we get a positron and an electron, the total net change in charge is zero. That's why we have one positive and one negative, because we haven't altered the amount of charge in the universe. Now, if we have an electron that combines with a positron, that produces two gamma rays that go off in different directions. In that case, um, all of the all the matter gets converted into radiant energy or gamma rays. Now, uh, this was one of Einstein's big conclusions was that you can change energy into matter and matter can be converted into energy. That's what happens if you have, say, a nuclear reaction, like in an atomic bomb, you are changing solid matter into energy. Just like with nuclear fuel, um, as you have this nuclear reaction taking place, some of that matter is getting converted into energy and uh, it's, we're using it to heat up a bunch of water. So in a nuclear reactor, we have two fuel rods that come close together. Uh, they give off radiation and that energy that's given off, then some of it is thermal energy and we use it to basically boil water. So if you ever wondered how a nuclear reactor works, it's basically just boiling water. Then once the water is boiled, it creates steam and we can turn a turbine. Now, we're gonna talk about energy a lot this semester. How many people here like nuclear energy? Nuclear is pretty good, right? What's great about nuclear? What are the good things about nuclear? It's clean air, there's no, it doesn't produce CO2. So it doesn't make any air pollution under normal what else is good about it? The gas. What? It is really powerful. What? Yeah. yeah. They, they're making it better all the time. They're making the reactor safer. And you can generate a lot of electricity. You don't keep needing to bring it to coal. Um, once you get those nuclear fuel rods, they're good for many, many years. You can produce electricity for years and years. Uh, they also use it on nuclear submarines. If you're on a nuclear submarine and you have a reactor, that's great because uh, the nuclear reactor will just run and power your sub. Uh, you can actually use the steam turbines to actually turn the propeller. Uh, so you could you can actually convert some of that energy directly into mechanical energy and run your submarine. Um, it would also, of course, produce electricity. Okay. What what's uh what are some of the downsides of nuclear energy? Nuclear waste is a is a problem. Um, once you once you use the nuclear fuel rod, um, you've got this substance that's highly radioactive, and you can't really do anything with it unless you recycle it. It's possible to recycle nuclear spent nuclear fuel rods, but What's the, what's the problem with uh, recycling nuclear fuel rods? What's one of the drawbacks of doing that? It's expensive. It costs a lot of money. So um, the, the, the benefits is that we can get a lot of electricity. We don't need any more, uh, we don't need to use fossil fuel. We don't, we don't produce CO2, but we've got to do something with the nuclear fuel rods. I read this um, book from the 1950s about nuclear power, and it, it was it was super happy and and almost joyous. And the, their idea was is they're like you know you can recycle the nuclear fuel rods indefinitely, and then 
Um, there will be a little bit that you can't recycle, but then all you have to do is bury that in a stable geological formation and you can just leave it there, it's fine. So how easy is it to find a stable geologic formation? It's, it's not so easy. It turns out that things move around underground and it's, it's hard to find a place to put this, okay? So um, that's one of the, 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 the drawbacks, but um, there are a lot of benefits. We get a lot of electricity from it. So, uh, so Germany is um, transitioning away from nuclear energy. And, um, and they're also trying to become um, not relying on fossil fuels. And so in order to do that, they're having to rely on nuclear energy until they can get enough solar and wind to power the country. But it's not easy. Um, now, charges conserved. And this is a picture of pair production. So this is how they, do, how they did the original experiments. Um, they felt uh, what they would do is they would have this uh, photographic plate and um, they would cover it, I think, uh, with uh, water or liquid helium. And when a gamma ray comes in, and if it produces uh, an electron and a positron, then they, uh, then they also apply a magnetic field. So there's a magnetic field coming out of the bottom. And as these charged particles uh, pass through this magnetic field, they curve in different directions, okay? So a positive particle will curve one way and a negative particle will curve the other way. And you can see, if you see the whole picture, uh, their paths look exact, almost exactly equal and opposite, okay? So we know that this is real. We know that we can convert um, energy into matter. Uh, but charges can serve. We can't just uh, get a bunch of negative charges or positive charges. Uh, it, has to, it has to be balanced. So we have to get one positive, one negative. Now, um, we're gonna talk about uh, currents, okay? Now, usually we, we know that it's the negative charges that are moving back and forth, uh, but really it doesn't have to always be negative. Um, in my laboratory, I can create a plasma in one of my systems, and then I can shoot positive ions, okay? So if I can make these positive ions in vacuum, I can also have current that way. I can have other charge carriers. So let's say, for example, I, I take this chinchilla fur, and I put it here, and I'm going to ground it this time. And I turn this on. Oh, oh, we lost it. Back here. Oh, oh, it doesn't work. Oh. See, there we go. Now I'm, I'm using chinchilla fur as my current carrier. So if I get a little bit of fuzz here, actually let me unground this. No, it doesn't work. Well, I'm gonna fix this. Uh, I'll make it better next time, guys. Need to put the copper on the little rubber belt. I don't think the copper is. I don't think the copper is touching it really good. So I need to. I need to make better contact. But, uh, but if I if I hold the ball there, then the fur will pass back and forth, and I'm carrying charges on the fur, but I'm transferring electrons. So even that in that case, it is a a positive charge. What about inside of the human body? How does current travel in your body? Because when, let's say you move your arm, your brain sends a signal to your arm and current passes through your nerve endings, it goes to your hand. Is that positive or negative? 
So let's take a vote. How many people think it's negative? How many people think it's positive? So uh, the answer is actually it's it's carried by positive ions. And it turns out that in your nervous system, there are little ion pumps that pump potassium and calcium in and out of your nerve ending. And so as the signal travels from your brain, these little pumps turn on and they send a positive signal to your hand, okay? Now, um, that's problematic because if you touch, say, a wire, okay, then what happens is the, the current wants to send electrons through your arm, except your nerves aren't really designed to have uh, electrons as a charge carrier. And so that can disrupt things, okay? Now, um, you can uh, restart somebody's heart if you, um, if you give them a big enough charge, it can get current flowing. So if you're a medical professional, that's, um, that can be important. All right, so let's, um, that's about the end of chapter 21, but let's do a problem. All right. All right, so I'm going to switch now and let's do one of the homework problems. So one of my favorites. All right, let's look at the problem where you have two charged spheres hanging down on wires, okay? And these charged spheres are suspended and they, have, they each have uh, an amount of charge Q and they're suspended from these two ropes like this, okay? Uh, they're not touching each other. There's a force of repulsion. So how many forces are acting on these charged spheres? Let's talk about all the forces that are acting on it. Somebody said gravity. Okay, so uh, we have M times G here on each of the spheres. Okay, so M times G. Now we can... We can just think about one sphere over here because the force on the other one is gonna be exactly the same. So we can just really kind of can focus on one of these spheres here. What other forces are acting on this? What'd you say? Tension, yes. There's tension going up here. Tension is at an angle like this though. So it's not exactly opposite. It's going up at an angle. And we'll say that the angle here is some angle theta, okay? What, there's another uh, force that's acting on these. What's the last force? Yes. Yeah, the electrostatic force. On this one here, which way is that charge acting? Yeah, opposite, because they're, they're repulsive, okay? So we'll call this F, Fe. That's my electric force. Now, this is, it's not moving, it's at equilibrium. So what does that mean that the total force on my, on my charge ball is going to be? Yeah, the net force is going to equal zero, right? But we have, um, to solve this problem, and I forget what the original problem was asking for. Um... What was this problem asking for? The what? Oh, it's Q. Yes. Uh, I think this was problem 11. Let me, the charge. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, we want to solve for the charge Q. All right. So let's talk about our, oh, no. Okay. So first let's find our X forces, okay? So what's the, what's the net force in the X direction? Zero, because it's at equilibrium. 
Okay, so I'm going to have my F net X force will equal zero, but this will equal, I have a charge going to the left here. So that'll be um, Fe, is that negative or positive? Yeah, we're gonna call this way negative. So we'll say negative Fe, okay? And then uh, I also have my force here in the right um, and it's going, we'll say it's going this way. Where does that force to, to the right come from? That's a tension. Right, the component of tension in the x direction. So I'll have uh, T times what? Sine, sine theta, that's right. Because of my angles here. So then it'll be T going here. So up here, this is my, uh, this is my Y component of tension. It's the opposite side here. So that's gonna give me sine of theta. Okay, let's write down our Y forces. So for Y, then I'll have uh, my net force is going to equal zero, but I will have um, my, uh, what are the forces? Someone tell me. There's gravity. Is that positive or negative? Negative Mg, then plus what? T cosine of theta. Right. Okay. So we can rearrange these now. So we, this is just, we just went through, we found our X and Y forces. So what's, what is F of V here? What's the magnitude of the electrostatic force? It's what? Okay, well, yes, they did give us those things. Well, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna walk through the problem and then you can, in the privacy of your dorm rooms, uh, plug in the actual numbers because algebra is something better to do alone. <laughs> okay, so what is the electric, I, I don't like, I mean, I like algebra, but okay, anyway. So what should I write here? Yes, KQ squared over R squared. And in the problem, they say, they call this, uh, that distance there X. And they say that the length of my rope here is L. So we can, we can stick to the conventions. And then I think they give you numbers for those. So my technique works like this. I don't put any, in, any numbers to the problem until I'm all the way at the end. Because what happens to me, if you start putting numbers in too soon, you're going to mess up. So I don't even care what the numbers are until I get to the end and I have this all simplified. And then I'll put numbers in and say, okay, now I can get an actual number. So this will be kx squared. Okay, so I can write that in there now. All right, now. Oh, yes. Okay, so now that I have this part, now I can say I'll have, uh, I will have K times Q squared over X squared. Then this is going to equal T sine of theta. And then I also have this expression here, uh, MG equals T cosine of theta. Okay, so now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my top equation here and I'm going to divide it by this equation, by the bottom. I can do that. I can take one expression and I can divide it by another expression. That's totally fine. I'm not hurting anything. This is a, a trick physicists like to do because what's sine of theta divided by cosine of theta? It's tangent of theta. And um, I don't know the angle necessarily, but I can get tangent of theta in terms of some other numbers. And so if, if all I know are those other numbers, then that could make my, my, my job easier. 
All right, so now I'm going to write this as. Now I'll write it as my T's will cancel. I'm going to divide these. Then I'll have tangent of theta is going to equal K times Q squared over X squared times, well, I'll just put this all down here. It'll be MG times X squared. There we go. All right, kind of messy, but that's okay. But now, I'm going to write something else here for tangent of theta. And um, let's look at my diagram up here. Okay. So I know that in general, tangent of theta is equal to, I'm going to say, y prime divided by x prime. Okay. That's a different y and x. I'm putting the prime there to denote that it's different. Right. So in my uh, in my diagram up here, I'm going to say right here, this part is x prime, and then over here, that that distance is y prime. Okay. Now, um, I, if I look at my drawing here, all right. Well, y prime. I know that the halfway there, that distance is x divided by two. So I can just look at this and I can say, all right. Y prime is X divided by two. X is what they gave us in the problem. So we know what X is. But then over here, X prime, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna replace that with something else. So um, I'm gonna say my, the hypotenuse of my triangle is L. So I will have L squared plus X prime squared plus Y prime squared. Um, y prime is X over two. So I'll have L squared plus X prime squared plus X over two squared. So now I can get an expression for X prime here. It'll be uh, X prime squared is gonna equal L squared minus x over two squared. Fun fact about Pythagoras, he lived on an island and he was the leader of a cult. And the only way that supposedly we know about the Pythagorean theorem is because one of the cultists escaped and took this with him. And otherwise, because they didn't tell anybody what they were doing. So maybe they had other theorems on the island, but. So if you ever watch Handmaiden's Tale, which I haven't seen, just imagine it was like a number cult instead, maybe. I don't know. I haven't actually watched that show, so I don't, I don't know anything about it. Um, okay, so now I can say that X prime, uh, I can take the square root of both sides, and then I can plug this in. And so now I have tangent of theta. I'll bring it all together, tangent of theta is equal to, I have X over two divided by the square root of L squared minus X over two squared. Okay, and now, now I have everything that I, I know, I know all these quantities. I know what L and I know what X are. I know what M and G and K are. So now, and I know X, so now I can solve for Q and get a number, okay? So, yes. So now it's just some algebra. You can rearrange that and you can get a number. All right, so that's all for today. Um, I do have office hours at four in Shannon Hall. I'll be there till five. So if you'd like to come and get help with your homework or talk about physics, I will be there. So I have Shannon Hall, room 113. And who's got the attendance sheet?
Oh, here you go. Thank you, like, and subscribe down below.